Dave Hashi. I'm a pharmacist and a professor with the Department of Family Medicine. And in this unit, we're going to be talking about hepatitis, specifically hepatitis A, B, and C. The main objectives that we're going to cover are fairly broad. First is we're going to be talking about some of the regional and national epidemiologies of hepatitis A, B, and C. We'll talk about the different screening and confirmatory testing between the three different types of hepatitis. And then we're going to talk specifically about hepatitis C and the hepatitis C care cascade and its impact on public health. We'll also talk about different resources to link patients to care, discuss common medications for hepatitis C, and look at harm reduction resources for persons at risk for contracting hepatitis B and C. Before we dive in talking about uh, the specific types of hepatitis, if we just step back and, and have a historical perspective, it's important to understand that hepatitis has evolved over the course of time as science has improved and we have a better understanding. Hepatitis A used to be referred to as infectious hepatitis, partly on how it's transmitted, uh, but that is a term you may see in some of the um, previous literature. But infectious hepatitis went on to be categorized as hepatitis A. Then there was serum hepatitis, which here in the U.S. is primary hep primarily hepatitis B, but you will also see some hepatitis D or delta referred to in the literature. And then for a long time through uh, the 70s and 80s, there was what was referred to as non-A, non-B hepatitis. We knew it wasn't hepatitis A, we knew it wasn't hepatitis B, but we didn't know what it was. It was eventually identified primarily in the U.S. as hepatitis C, and it was identified as being transmitted primarily parentally, also through blood transfusions uh, several decades ago, and because of that, that was a major mode of transmission before blood supply was being screened. Outside of hepatitis A, B, and C, uh, you may see in some of the literature uh, hepatitis E. It's not very prevalent here in the U.S. You may see it in other parts of the world. Same thing with hepatitis F and G, very uncommon. But talking about hepatitis A, hepatitis A is a significant form of hepatitis that is found across the globe and uh, has varying prevalence. However, one common thread is it is usually found in areas of low socioeconomic um, status, whether areas of poverty, uh, areas in which there is poor sanitation, uh, access to um, uh, good plumbing, toilets, and so forth. And part of that is because the transmission of hepatitis A is fecal oral. So usually the virus will shed in the GI tract and active virus will be eliminated in the feces and individuals who do not wash hands or just because of the high burden of virus, it may be easy to transmit for individuals who do not wash their hands, handle food or other things in which the virus is then transmitted to the next person. In the U.S., outside of uh, a few isolated um, uh, outbreaks annually, whether food, in the homeless, or in daycares, a lot of the hepatitis A that is seen is in those individuals who travel. And a lot of times it's travel to either Mexico or South America, where patients may be infected on vacation uh, and return to the U.S. and then um, bring the case with them. But as I mentioned, there have been outbreaks associated um, with uh, food handling. The incidence of hepatitis A over the last several decades, as you can see, has ebbed and flowed. And, uh, and we started seeing a massive decline in hepatitis A with the introduction of uh, more global and universal uh, vaccines, especially in children, um, but also in those adults who have um, major risk factors. However, when we look at uh, more recent uh, trends in transmission data, we see that we've had a significant rise over the last several years. This has been seen primarily in 
uh, patients suffering from homelessness uh, here in the U.S. And as part of that, we've expanded recommendations for hepatitis A vaccine uh, with, again, broader use of the vaccine. I've already alluded that hepatitis A transmission is primarily fecal to oral, but just to dive a little bit deeper, again, it is from person-to-person -person contact. Uh, usually can be seen with transmissions in households, especially in children who are infected or infants infected with hepatitis A, who may not show a lot of signs, but may be transmitting, shedding the virus. And for those who have not received the vaccine, uh, individuals may contract it fairly easily. There's also sexual transmission or uh, transmission in residential institutions, daycares, uh, it's been seen in military personnel. And the one I've highlighted here is those individuals experiencing homelessness. And that has been one of the uh, major uh, subpopulations that have experienced uh, hepatitis A. Also in contact with contaminated food or water, a lot of times with uh, food that may be brought into the U.S. Uh, that may be contaminated or uh, handled by individuals who are infected. And rarely um, through blood transfusions um, and sometimes people who inject drugs. In the interest of time and for you uh, as a learner to, uh, to look for other resources, there is a link out to different videos that will help uh, emphasize the disease course. But essentially, Individuals who are exposed to the virus will have a sharp rise in virus replication within their body, followed by symptoms such as uh, jaundice, fatigue, general flu-like symptoms. Uh, and because of that, uh, it may be, uh, uh, patients may not always seek medical care. And hepatitis A is diagnosed by laboratory studies, by somebody having antibodies to the virus. There are two different types of antibodies. The first one is referred to as IgM, which is an acute response to exposure to the virus. And then IgE, which persists for decades, develops several months after the exposure and is protective. The IgG antibodies is also what is developed after the vaccine. Chronic hepatitis A does not exist in the concept that we understand chronic disease, but there are instances in which some patients may have relapsing remitting hepatitis A, but again, very uncommon. There are no specific uh, antiviral medications or treatment for hepatitis A, primarily supportive treatment. 85% of infected patients uh, have a full recovery within three months. And fatalities are extremely rare with hepatitis A and uh, may occur in individuals who have pre-existing liver disease, cirrhosis, uh, or other forms of hepatitis on top of that. And I described briefly relapsing hepatitis A, very uncommon, but some patients may experience a relapse um, during six months after an acute illness. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, has very strong and clear and uh, well-supported recommendations for hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, and outside of general recommendations for um, children and adults, we have what's referred to as pre-exposure use as well as post-exposure. Pre-exposure is used in individuals who are traveling internationally to areas of high rates of hepatitis A who have not been vaccinated. Uh, the vaccines were approved back in the, uh, in the 90s and uh, the patient should be vaccinated as soon as they know they are going to be traveling, preferably six months so they can get both doses of their vaccine but at least uh, a couple weeks before travel. There's also an option of uh, a drug called immune globulin. And this is passive immunity in which the individual, along with the vaccine, 
uh, can get an injection of this immune globulin, which provides passive immunity for about up to six months. Then there is post-exposure. Let's use an example of uh, an outbreak that may happen at uh, a food service uh, location. Patients identified as having hepatitis A, notification goes out to the community. Uh, if you have eaten at this location in the past two weeks, you may be a candidate for a vaccine if you have not been vaccinated. So within two weeks of an exposure, individuals can receive the vaccine, um, which is extremely effective at reducing transmission if given within that two week window. Individuals who may have a contraindication to the vaccine um, may use immune globulin, but again, the vaccine is preferred. Here's another table representing uh, the different uh, uh, approaches to both vaccine as well as um, uh, the dose of the immune globulin uh, for both um, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis are options. Dosing of the vaccine, uh, hepatitis A, there are two commercially available uh, formulations available. Both of those are two doses. Uh, the volume may depend on the age, but still dosing at time zero and then uh, between six and 12 months. Now, hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a very complex uh, disease state. And with that, there are uh, very complex mechanisms of disease pathology, uh, transmission, and treatment. We're not going to dive into a lot of the complexities, but I do encourage you to go to the University of Washington's Hepatitis B Online course, as identified in Unit 1, uh, to supplement some of the education. Looking at the geographic distribution of hepatitis B, it is very prevalent worldwide. However, in the U.S., it is, uh, has a very low prevalence. But in, uh, in India and in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, you can see uh, much higher rates of hepatitis B as well as in um, China and Southeast Asia. And as hepatitis B has been uh, tracked by the CDC uh, for decades, you can see that, uh, that there was a uh, high point of this disease uh, prior to vaccines being introduced. And once the vaccines had been introduced, we saw a massive reduction over time. And nowadays we have essentially universal hepatitis B uh, vaccine uh, recommendations. So having this broader use of the vaccines has dramatically reduced hepatitis B transmission uh, in the U.S. Most of the hepatitis B that is seen in the U.S. Uh, occurs in foreign-born individuals, primarily in those uh, from Asia. Therefore, if you are working in parts of the U.S. where there are higher pockets of uh, Asian communities, uh, you may see more. However, uh, it is fairly uncommon um, to see it in uh, U.S. born individuals. The other thing to note about uh, death from hepatitis B is that, uh, is that hepatitis B and hepatitis C cause chronic changes to the liver. And because of that, there are higher rates of liver disease, liver cancer, and we have seen a massive growth in liver-related deaths um, over time with the, with the projection that it may increase. Whereas we have seen a reduction in deaths from things like HIV. So from a public health perspective, it's really important that we are able to continue to uh, reduce hepatitis B transmission and effectively treat it. As far as the transmission of hepatitis B, it is considered a sexually transmitted disease, but it is transmitted um, via other methods, including injection drug use, vertical transmission from mother to child, um, contact with blood or open sores with an infected person, occupational exposure, primarily through uh, needle, um, 
uh, needle sticks, and then sharing uh, items such as razors, toothbrushes with an infected person. So looking at the risk factors, a lot of those translate, including infants born to infected mothers. Moms should be screened and infants exposed to mothers who are hepatitis B positive have a very high likelihood of going on to develop chronic hepatitis B. That's why from a public health perspective, it's very important to screen mothers as well as administer hepatitis B vaccine at birth. Sexual transmission occurs in, uh, in uh, seen in men who have sex with men, uh, those with multiple sex partners, uh, and those whose partners are infected with hepatitis B. Injection drug use, household contacts, and hemodialysis are also listed as risk factors. I also mentioned that hepatitis B is a very complex and dynamic disease process. And just as a brief introduction, you can also view hepatitis B transmission uh, patterns uh, on, uh, on YouTube, looking at the CDC's website as well. But just as a brief summary, for those individuals who develop chronic hepatitis B, and again, not all hepatitis B goes chronic, some people will clear it, but for those who have chronic hepatitis B, there are different phases that they may go through. Uh, they may have high levels of hepatitis B, and with those high levels of hepatitis B, the liver may have a lot of um, response and damage to that. So there is this immune response and this immune activation. But as the immune system kicks in, we may also see the disease get a little bit controlled. And as that disease controls, um, the inflammation may settle down, but over time there may be reactivation. And this can cycle and happen really through any dynamic process. And patients with chronic hepatitis B really should be referred to and cared for by uh, a specialist either in infectious disease or in hepatology. In shifting and looking at indications for hepatitis B, uh, really at this point, there's universal hepatitis B vaccine uh, recommendations for all infants and all unvaccinated children under 19. And it's sort of getting that way for adults, but really for adults, vaccine should be given for those at risk of acquiring hepatitis B, but also anybody requesting it. If they walk into the health department, into a pharmacy, into a clinic and say, I want to be vaccinated for hepatitis B, that vaccine should be administered um, given they have no contraindications. There are a couple different options for hepatitis B vaccine. There's what we what is referred to as the standard dose. These were approved in the 90s globally. Um, they, they are thimerosal free or preservative free. It is made up of highly purified hepatitis B surface antigen, which creates an immune response without um, uh, having any risk of uh, transmission of the virus. And it is usually a standard three dose vaccine at zero, one, and six months. In some cases, there may be a need for four doses at zero, one, and two, and six months. And then in 2017, a newer uh, recombinant um, uh, vaccine, adjuvated vaccine, was uh, approved and uh, made available on the market. And the major difference between this novel dose as compared to the standard dose is that uh, it is only two doses times zero in one month. So there may be higher rates of vaccine completion um, and also zero conversion in certain circumstances. Here is a visual representation of uh, the different vaccine types as well as schedules that is pulled from the hepatitis uh, B online course. And you can see the different um, brands of uh, hepatitis B vaccine, Heplisave B, which is the novel, is two doses times zero in one month. And then um, the standard doses for Endurex and Recombivax uh, and Twinrix has both hepatitis A and B vaccines in it. All of those generally are times zero, um, one month 
and uh, six months. And this is a bit more of an in-depth table for your reference that summarizes the different types, the different ages. Um, the one thing to note is that Heplosave B, the novel, newer one, is not indicated yet in individuals um, under 18, um, nor in um, women who are pregnant. There's also the combination of hepatitis A and B vaccines, such as Twinrix, um, in which those vaccines, you're usually giving three doses of hepatitis B compared to two, excuse me, two doses of hepatitis A as compared to three doses. Lastly, hepatitis C. Uh, hepatitis C is again a uh, different form of hepatitis. This is an uh, RNA virus, has some uh, similarities as well as significant differences. But looking at the epidemiology, going back into the 80s uh, until this was uh, identified as hepatitis C and not just as non-A, non-B hepatitis, the major routes of transmission were through blood transfusion. And uh, once the blood supply was being screened, we saw a significant drop in transmission of hepatitis C. But as you can see on the tail end of this graph, the slope slowly starts to increase. And uh, that increase has been seen because of the opioid crisis, and we'll look at that here shortly. Uh, but prevalence, again, is the uh, amount of persons uh, living with hepatitis C at one time. And, and what's unique about hepatitis C is that we have new infections and uh, a small subset of persons with new infections will clear the virus on their own and they will essentially self-cure. But those who develop chronic hepatitis C is represented in this um, gray cylinder in the middle. Uh, some will go on to die either from hepatitis C related causes or other causes. Others will be treated to cure and will come out of this pool. Some of those individuals may be reinfected. Hepatitis C, uh, for those that uh, are cured, uh, may have secondary infections if they have ongoing risk of transmission. And again, the epidemiology, as I mentioned, we've seen an increase in rates. And when we look at the distribution, the distribution is in uh, those younger individuals and those who are identified as baby boomers born between um, 1945 and 65. And the reason for this bimodal distribution is the uh, older population, primarily that disease transmission and, and um, infection is seen from uh, the blood transfusions although uh, injection drug use and other reasons can also contribute to that. In the younger population, that is most likely seen from the, uh, the opioid crisis, injection drug use, and because of that, we've seen this spike in, uh, in transmission of hepatitis C. So the major risk of transmissions in the U.S. are from injection drug use. Uh, but other ones include transfusions prior to 1992, when the blood screen blood uh, pool had started to be screened more regularly. Those undergoing solid organ transplant, men who have sex with men, uh, hepatitis C is generally not considered a sexually transmitted disease, but it has been uh, documented in the men who have sex com with men community. Body tattoos. This is generally. Um, seen in tattoos that are done in non-sterile environments. And then lastly, because the virus can live outside the body on um, drug equipment, those who share uh, drug paraphernalia, even with intranasal drug use outside of injection drug use, um, may also see risk of transmission. After somebody is, is infected, there is a general natural course for people who go on to develop chronic hepatitis C but it's a very slow process and uh, patients may not exhibit any symptoms. So unless we are doing universal screening, which we should be, uh, patients may uh, go on with hepatitis C for years um, without any symptoms um, that are recognizable. 
But sometimes after 10, 15, 20 years, um, we can see some inflammation of the liver, can see some changes in the contextual um, appearance of the liver, um, the cellular structure of the liver, and those individuals may go on to develop end-stage liver disease, cirrhosis, um, or, uh, or cancer. And that is represented in kind of both of these uh, pictorials. But for those individuals who may be treated and cured, we can stop some of that progression before it gets to some of those later stages. One of the concepts that was introduced from a public health perspective uh, several years ago was what's called the hepatitis C care continuum. And what is great about this is that um, through public health surveillance and understanding of treatment, we were able to identify that, and again, th this is years ago, that um, there were about 4 million people living with hepatitis C in the US. Only about half of those were actually aware of their diagnosis. And then you can continue to see the fall off in patients accessing care, uh, patients undergoing treatment, and actual patients being cured. This is older national data, and more recent data suggests that all of these, through public health approaches of screening, better access to care, better medications, have improved all of these um, uh, outcomes. But taking that first step in um, diagnosing hepatitis C, uh, there is universal um, screening that is suggested, and you can follow this uh, YouTube link out there to um, see what the disease course of hepatitis C is like. So the main recommendation for screening is just looking for the antibody. The antibody tells you, have you been exposed to hepatitis C, yes or no? If that antibody is negative or non-reactive, then there is no need to continue uh, any type of workup. If that antibody is positive or reactive, all it tells you is that that individual has been exposed to hepatitis C. It doesn't tell you if they actually have the virus or not. So the confirmatory testing that has to happen is what's called hepatitis C RNA, is actually looking for the virus in the blood. So this is a blood test usually done uh, uh, either through a doctor's office or a health department that has the ability to um, send this out and screen for that virus. If there is no detectable virus, that means the individual has uh, been exposed to the virus but cleared it on their own. They do not have any active infection. If virus is detected within the body, that means they have chronic hepatitis C and those individuals should be linked to a provider who knows the nuances of treating hepatitis C and can um, cure the hepatitis C. And that is the goal for people living with, HIV, with hepatitis C, is treatment cure. And treatment cure of hepatitis C is defined as no detectable virus 12 weeks after completing therapy. And therapy should be available and offered to everyone, um, regardless of insurance status, um, substance use, um, uh, there may be special considerations for individuals with late-stage liver disease, but this is uh, now a disease that can be universally treated and cured uh, and uh, reduce the number of new infections and transmissions. There are numerous uh, medications available for patients. Um, he, these are a... Uh, the most common that are used in the U.S. Uh, a lot of the times it is a treatment course of daily therapy uh, once a day for eight weeks or for 12 weeks, depending on the type of hepatitis C virus. Uh, and as long as the patient can complete that through the course of therapy, there is approximately a 90 to 95 percent chance that they will be cured of hepatitis C. Again, another pictorial of what this generally looks like. Uh, the arbitrary number of virus at baseline 
that somebody may have in their system. They initiate therapy. Usually within several weeks, that virus is, um, within days to weeks, that virus is uh, no longer detectable in the blood. Then after eight to 12 weeks at the end of treatment, that virus is still undetectable. And then a cure would be defined as 12 weeks after therapy uh, has ended, there is no detectable virus. Again, patients may get reinfected with hepatitis C, but generally they will not relapse. Uh, patients who have no detectable virus will stay cured, and that is the definition of treatment. So to bring everything back together, uh, understanding the nuances and differences between hepatitis A, B, and C, and understanding that there is different epidemiology, different rates of transmission, uh, and the screening for them is also different. Uh, you should be able to describe some of the hepatitis C care cascade, uh, understanding uh, how to engage patients in different aspects of that care cascade to get them treated and cured. There should also uh, be some links either through health departments or through medical providers to get patients into care, uh, understanding some of the medications and how the, uh, and how the medications can lead to uh, positive outcomes and cures. And lastly, uh, risk reductions in, re in resources for patients um, uh, looking to reduce the likelihood of contracting hepatitis B and C, looking at vaccines for hepatitis A and B, as well as other harm reduction strategies.